Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be a professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, lecture 30 is going to be a continuation of what we did at the end of lecture 29, naturally, for which we had, we had started talking about the idea of a finite field. Um, so you recall that at the end of lecture 29, we proved that all finite fields um, will have have two very important properties that the order of a finite field is always a power of a prime um, and that's often abbreviated as Q all right so when you see Q being used as a subscript that means a power of a prime so all fields have an order all finite fields have an order of power of a prime and in fact if you have two finite fields let's say that F and E are finite fields who have the same order they both equal Q here uh, that's a hideous Q, try that again. Then in fact, the finite fields are, are isomorphic to each other. So finite fields are unique up to order. This is kind of the same thing for cyclic groups. So in many ways, uh, finite fields are the field equivalent of cyclic groups, finite cyclic groups, uh, for which we'll see some more of that parallel uh, later on in this video, in fact. Well, not this video, actually the next video in this lecture series, uh, in this lecture in particular. But in this video, uh, we are going to define the notion of the Galois field. What does that mean? Um, so let Q be a power of a prime. Uh, so Q equals P to the N, where P is a prime. Then we, we know by the previous result that there is one field up to isomorphism of order Q. So we call that the field of order Q. It'll be denoted um, often as FQ. Uh, typically, the Blackboard font is used if you put it in LaTeX, but by hand, sometimes you'll just write it as just F sub Q. Um, some people will often denote this as GF of Q. Now, that does not mean gluten-free. In this context, we call it the Galois field, um, named after Galois, of course. Uh, and so commonly, when people refer to finite fields, you might hear them called Galois fields as well. So finite field and Galois field are used interchangeably in this situation because as there's a unique field, finite field of order Q, we call that the Galois field of order Q. Now, this is not to be confused with the Galois group, which we'll define later on. The Galois group does measure an important attributes of field extensions. It is related. So we can talk about Galois groups of Galois um, fields. Um, and this is also not to be confused with the term of a Galois extension. Um, because of that, because of that potential confusion, I think I'll prefer just to call them finite fields and the field of order Q as opposed to calling them Galois fields because I don't want to confuse with the Galois theory, which we will do a few more lectures later. Uh, but be aware that is used in practice in the literature Galois fields are referring to the finite field of order Q. All right, so let me prove a very important theorem when it comes to Galois fields. Uh, in particular, how are they nested inside of each other? So given any field, so if, if F is a field of order P to the N, right, then that tells us that ZP is in fact going to be contained inside of F because this is the prime field. Now ZP is by definition the field FP, right? And this is the field um, FQ. So every field, every a uh, finite field is going to contain its prime field. But what about other ones? D we've talked about previously in this lecture series, the field of order four. Uh, there's also a field of order eight, order 16, order 32, order 64. Do these fields contain each other? Um, is it like the field of order eight contains the field of order four and the field of order 16 contains the field of order eight? That would lead to a lot simpler containment, but it's not like that. Uh, the webbing is a little bit more complicated and it has to do with the divisibility of the exponent. And that's what the theorem we have on the screen tells us. Uh, so let P be a prime. Then the field of order P to the M is contained inside of the field of order P to the N, if and only if the exponents M divide N. And so this is an if and only if statement will go in both directions. So assume the first direction. Suppose that one Galois field is contained inside the other. So we have P to the M contained inside of the field of order P to the N. Now, these... Uh, this vec uh, excuse me, this field containment, this field extension implies a vector space uh, argument as well. That is, this is a, we can view this as a subspace of this vector space. Both of them are vector spaces over the base field FP. So when we look at F uh, sub P to the N, this is an N-dimensional FP vector space. Um, and when we look at FPM, this is going to be an M-dimensional 
FP vector space. But because this is a field extension, the degree of the map FPN over FP factors as FPN over FPM, uh, by assumption, that's a subfield, and FPM over FP, for which like I said, this first one is equal to n, this one is equal to m, and so then we see that n can be factored using m, and that's exactly what divisibility means. So m does have to divide n to be a subfield. Okay, um, why does it go the other direction? Well, suppose that m divides n. That is, there's some integer k such that km is equal to n, like so. Um, take an take a arbitrary element of the field f sub p to the m. Um, and I want you to consider the polynomial x to the p to the n minus x. Notice here that by previous work, the field uh, of order p to the n is the splitting field of this polynomial. So, and when we, we actually showed a stronger argument. You belong to the field of order p to the n if and only if you're a root of this polynomial. Okay, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to show that alpha is a root of this polynomial. Therefore, it is contained inside of the splitting field of that polynomial. So therefore, since alpha was chosen arbitrarily, the entire set F sub P to the M is contained inside the field of order P to the M. That's the strategy here. So let's evaluate um, the polynomial F at this element alpha. Now we do have the property that since alpha belongs to F sub P to the M, we have that alpha to the P to the M power is equal to alpha. Okay, again, this was something we proved in the previous video here. So if we take alpha to the P to the N minus alpha, we can then factor N because N is equal to K times M like so. And then using some exponent laws, this is the same thing as alpha to the p to the m to the kth power. Um, for which, what does that mean here? So we have to be careful with our exponents here. We're taking p to the m to the kth power. We're not taking this to the kth power. That's a different thing there. So in particular, p to the m shows up k times in the exponent. Um, and so by exponential laws, if you have a factored exponent, you can then iterate the exponent. So this is the same thing as alpha to the p to the m, 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 all the way up to the p to the m, like so. But by induction, since alpha to the p to the m is equal to alpha, this then becomes just alpha. Raised to the p to the m just becomes alpha again. Then you have the next one, you just get alpha again, and you iterate this until you eventually just end up with a single alpha. Alpha minus alpha is equal to zero. And so like we mentioned above, since alpha is a root of f of x, and since the field of order p to the n is the splitting field for f of x, that means alpha has to belong to that. Since alpha was arbitrary, that means this entire set, f sub p to the m is a subset of f p to the n, and that then gives us the containment. So we get divisibility. Divisibility implies containment. Um, the field of order p to the m is a subfield of p to the n if and only if, right, if and only if m divides n. So let's look at a specific example. So let's look at the field of order p to the 24, where p is an arbitrary prime, because the argument actually didn't depend on the prime, it depended on the exponent here. So if you take the field of order p to the 24, what are the divisors to 24? Um, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, and 12. Uh, and then 24, of course. So the subfields of p to the 20, the field of order p to the 24th is going to be these fields. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it has 8 subfields because there are 8 divisors of 24. All right. But how are these fields contained inside of each other? So if you take, for example, 12, what divides 12? 4 divides 12, 6 divides 12, 2 divides 12, 3 divides 12, and 1 divides 12. All the divisors of 24 divide 12 except for 8 and 12, 24 itself. So those are the subfields of 12. Who divides 8? Um, well, 4 divides 8, 2 divides 8, and 1 divides 8. You can't have any divisors of 3. So those are the subfields of the field of order p to the 8. Um, who are the subfields of p to the 6? Well, you get 2, 3, 1, and of course 6 itself. Who are the divisors of p to the 4th? Well, the divisors of 4 are 4, 2, and 1. Um, and then since 2 and 3 are prime numbers, the divisors of p squared and p cubed are themselves, and then zp. Uh, FP here. And so FP, of course, is only divisor as well. So when you look at the lattice of subfields for F 
sub p to the 24, you see just the divisibility lattice of 24. So this lattice is isomorphic to the, div to the divisor lattice of 24. And so when it comes to organizing the subfields of finite fields, um, we get a very simple observation. This The lattice of subfields of a finite field is just the same as the divisor lattice of the, e the, the exponent of p in that situation. So this is our first look, of course, at Galois theory right here. That we have these Galois group, these Galois fields we talked about. Um, the Ga Galois theory is very interested in classifying the subfields of a field. Basically, we look for lattices much like this. The Galois group then helps us uh, organize these things. Now it turns out that Galois theory for finite fields is trivial because of the previous theorem. And so when one talks about Galois theory, we often ignore finite fields because it's such a special case that it's somewhat insulated from the rest of it. Um, but in other words, we have solved this problem of, of the Galois theory, the Galois problem, without even defining what the Galois problem is yet because finite fields are so well behaved compared to perhaps field in general. Um, as we study Galois theory later on in this lecture series, we'll be primarily interested in uh, looking for the subfields of fields that extend the rational numbers. And that's something we'll talk about, of course, uh, in a future lecture.